Oh, yeah! What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to The Fringe. Um, this is a video that I really take no pride in making. I did not want to make this. Again, I try to keep things as lighthearted as I can on the channel, as I've said in previous videos, but this one is one where we really have to get down and serious about what is headed Canada's way in the near future. We've seen for a long time the Banks of Canada, or the Bank of Canada, sorry, talking about withholding interest rates to keep them high, to try and reduce inflation, to try and get things back on track. We all know that this wasn't possible, and people have been talking for quite some time of a crash headed our way. Now, the Bank of Canada coming out on the 9th, just a few days ago, to essentially show the calm before the storm as things are about ready to collapse in this country. The reason I want to put out this video is to highlight what was discussed in there and what this means for Canadians going forward. Now, we're not going to delay anything on this video. I don't want to get into any chit-chat or, or, or uh, blabber. Let's get straight to the point here. Uh, the Bank of Canada, brace yourselves for a financial crash. Some indicators of financial stress have risen. At the same time, the violations of some financial assets appear to have become uh, or valuations, sorry, have become stretched. This is very alarming. Um, let's take a listen to what was said, and then we're going to go over the actual report. Some indicators of financial stress have risen. At the same time, the valuations of some financial assets appear to have become stretched. This could increase the risk of a sharp correction that could generate system-wide stress. The recent rise in the use of leverage in non-bank financial institutions could amplify the effects of such a correction. Some indicators of... What's alarming about this and what we're seeing out of this that, that really worries me, but we're not going to see any rest to it, Justin Trudeau has been recklessly spending, especially in the last year, to try and show people going into a 2025 election why the Liberals are still viable to be voting for. They've talked about lunch programs, they've talked about housing accelerator funds, we've talked about capital gains taxes supposedly making up for the reckless spending that Justin Trudeau did over the pandemic with his money printing and CERB payments. There's even discussions of pilot programs coming to an end for UBI and rolling out a full-scaled program so that people essentially can own nothing and be happy depending on the government. And while they tout all those things and spend billions and billions of dollars, as the Bank of Canada says here, that some of the financial assets appear to have become stretched, and that's because Justin Trudeau doesn't have a darn clue about money or how the financial system works. Now, if we head over to the Financial Stability Report issued on May 9th, Let's take a look at what was said here. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here as Senior Deputy Governor Carolyn Rogers to discuss the Bank of Canada's Financial Stability Report. Part of the bank's mandate is to preserve and promote the stability of Canadian financial system. Stable and resilient financial system means that people can access credit and manage their assets safely and predictably in good times and in bad, which again, as we get into, is going to be mostly bad. It also reduces the need for authorities to intervene in periods of financial stress. In short, a stable financial system is critical to Canada's economic well-being. Every year, the bank publishes this report to offer an assessment of the stability of Canada's financial system and highlight risks that could threaten that stability. To make the purpose of the report clear, we've changed its name from the Financial System Review to the Financial Stability Report. Right there tells you why we should all be worried. They've even gone as far as to change the name, so as they're being very accurate at this point for their fear-mongering. The Canadian financial system is highly interconnected. Stress in one sector can spread to others. Again, most smart people know that, but our Prime Minister doesn't. The emphasis on the FSR is on risks that could ultimately affect the broader financial system and threaten its stability. The report focuses in particular on risks that involve the developments in the economy, we look at risks that could lead to system-wide stress in four key sectors, households, businesses, banks, non-bank financial institutions, such as pension funds, insurance companies, and fund managers. Housing is going to be a big one because especially if anybody's bought a house in the last year to two years when they're at peak prices, those people don't have equity in their homes. And if they do, it's very little. Things are going to get tough. There are also important risks that are more operational and structural in nature, such as cyber attacks, risks related to climate change. I love how they throw that in, like it's something that impacts everybody's wallets. 
aside from the carbon tax. We typically will discuss those on banks' financial system hubs, but when major developments arise, they appear to be the FSR as well. What are the key messages from today's FSR? The first message is that Canada's financial system remains resilient. No, it doesn't. Over the past year, households, businesses, banks, and other financial institutions have taken proactive steps to adjust their highest interest rates and to weather economic shocks. Again, no, they haven't. The second message is that this adjustment still is coming away to go and continues to present risks on financial stability. I'll offer some context around this assessment, and then the senior deputy government will touch on the risks of the different sectors. Over the past year, the risk of recession has diminished in Canada and globally. I don't buy that for a second. Inflation in most economies has come down, and inflation targets are in sight. However, there could be volatility in markets as expectations shift about when and by how much central banks will lower their policy rates. And there continue to be important geopolitical and economic risks on the horizon. Essentially, governments spending, 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 sending money to the Ukraine, laundering money, um, rising deficits. Against the backdrop, households and businesses continue to adjust. The past interest rate increases. Some indicators of financial stress have risen. At the same time, the valuations of some financial assets appear to have become stretched. This increased the risk of sharp correction and could generate system-wide stress. The recent rise in the use of leverage in the non-bank financial sector could amplify the effects of such a correction. What's most important is that to properly manage risks, financial system participants need to remain proactive and financial authorities need to remain vigilant. He then passes it on uh, to this Carolyn where she says, let me touch on each of the sectors. I'll start with households. So far, most households have proven resilient in the face of higher interest rates and inflation. Overall, we've seen households adjusting to higher debt servicing costs. No. Pierre Polyev talks about it all the time. You've seen Facebook groups where people are dumpster diving to eat because they can't afford their rent. They can't afford their mortgages. They're being gouged. Interest rates. What was it Trudeau said? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. No, you have to service the costs. This does not mean the adjustments has been easy. Clearly, these individuals and families who are feeling very stretched. What we're evaluating and are there are indicators of overall stress in the system. You think? Some of the indicators of household financial stress that fell during the pandemic are back to our above normal levels. Survey data suggests renters are experiencing the biggest increase in financial stress after hitting historic lows during the pandemic. The share of households without a mortgage that are behind on credit card or auto loan payments has come back up to or surpassed typical levels. Again, people are just trying to get by with a carbon tax, with all these extra fees, with interest rate hikes. Don't forget, if you're renewing your mortgage, on a, on a five-year closed or a three-year closed, um, if you were signed on prior to 2021, you were paying pretty comfortable rates, whereas now your payments are going to go up several hundred dollars a month on the average mortgage just for re-signing on your mortgage. So people, of course, are using their credit cards. They're deferring payments. They're doing all sorts of different things to try and keep their heads afloat. Really, they're just taking on more debt and keeping their heads slightly above water as they're treading. It's the same as trying to tread water with somebody's foot on your head. Over the past year, the share of borrowers with a mortgage who will carry a credit card balance of at least 90% or 80% of their credit card limit has continued to climb. Among mortgage holders, indicators of financial stress have remained relatively low, even as many have been coping with higher mortgage payments. Again, they're not going to come out and say the truth because they don't want you know nationwide panic. Since the bank began raising its policy rate in March of 2022, payments have increased for roughly half of outstanding mortgages while the banks, you know, are pocketing all that profit. Over the next two and a half years, most of the remaining mortgages will renew, and these borrowers are likely to face relatively larger payment increases. Yeah, sounds like everything's in control to me. At the same time, many mortgage holders also have seen their wages go up. No, they haven't. Please tell me where that's happened. Some have proactively adjusted their spending to help offset higher debt payments. Many also report higher levels of savings available to offset increased payments. So again, if anybody has savings, let's just rip it out of their pockets because they should be going check to check. Uh, higher interest rates are also affecting business. Higher rates are slowing the demand for the goods and services that businesses sell. No, people can't afford them all. That's the problem. It's while also increasing their financial costs. So far, financial health of large businesses appears solid. 
Like, it just goes on and on. Let me close by repeating an important point the governor made at the beginning. The connections in the financial system mean that if risks materialize in one sector, they can spread quickly. This puts a premium on preparedness. The proactive steps taken by the financial system participants have been positive, and they need to continue stable and resilient financial system benefits all Canadians. Now, again, I know that's a very long letter to go through, and I know I'm cutting in bits and pieces of it. Again, I don't want to miss the points that I was trying to make on this. This spells disaster. They've said it several times in that report. What affects one strain is going to affect another. It's almost symbiotic in the state that what affects one affects the other. You're going to see people who are renewing mortgages who can't afford their mortgage payments. You're going to see credit card debt spiking. You're going to see people, again, as Pierre says, there's already people living out of dumpster diving groups just to eat. Where do you think the majority of Canadians are going to be when they renew these mortgages, when interest rates are still prominently high as they're talking about these services being stretched? We are on the brink of financial ruin in this company. And to anybody who owns a home, um, anybody who's got any savings, anybody who's thinking about the future, buckle up. Because it's about to get significantly worse in this country, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to get much, much worse before it gets better. Let me know what you guys think down below in the comments. If it's your first time here, I hope this video has earned your subscription. Make sure as you're clicking that button below, you hit your bell for notifications so you can be alerted whenever this channel is dropping new content. And join us live here on the channel every Friday. Aside from this one, I will be out of town over the long weekend, but join us every Friday after that at 6 p.m. Central or 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, sorry, for Friday Night Fringe, where we go over everything that's happened in the past week, everything coming up in the week ahead, and some back and forth within our community. I always look forward to seeing you guys outside of those streams and hearing what you guys have to say, and uh, it's the highlight of my week. I, I definitely look forward to that more than anything else. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and got at least informed. I know there's not much to enjoy from it, uh, but have a great rest of your day. I'll catch you on the next one.